not only is he a superstar scientist, as Steve of the Smithsonian has called him, he's also an excellent science communicator. He's testified before Congress four times about the importance of conserving coral reef ecosystems. And he has greatly influenced the U.S.'s decision to sign on to the U.N. Treaty for Ocean Biodiversity, which is a huge deal. His film, Chasing Coral, brings public attention to the threats that coral reefs face from climate change. Chasing Coral's deeply resonating narrative has earned it several awards, uh, some of which include an Emmy and a People's Choice Award at the Sundance Film Festival. Dr. Porter is here with us today to continue sharing his message that coral reefs are vital ecosystems that are worth protecting. And without further ado, I'd like you all, I'd like to invite all of you to join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. James Porter. What an honor and a privilege it is to be here on your campus. And I can say that after two days of being with the students and with the extraordinary faculty who mentor them. The future is in good hands because it is in your hands. And also what an extraordinary privilege to be invited back to the place where I grew up. When Steve called me on the phone, in addition to the garbled communication from the scuba snorkel that was in my mouth, <laughs> I said, well, you're calling me because you knew I was from Ohio. No, I had no idea. <laughs> well, you're all going to find out about that and how it relates to what we're doing today. My talk is going to be about blurring the lines between medicine and ecology while saving coral reefs in the Florida Keys. And you're going to see how all of the sciences come together to make an integrated whole, which is the kind of education that is going on here at Miami, which is the kind of education that is going to produce the solutions for the future. It is that kind of thinking where the barriers between departments are low. And that's what I felt when I walked all over this campus, the integrated thinking. Now, coral reefs are truly extraordinary environments by any standard. They are by far the most diverse environments on Earth with 30 of the 32 island. Compare and contrast that with the puny biodiversity of a tropical rainforest <laughs> <laughs> that only has eight such fiber. And if you exclude my undergraduate major of entomology class in SECA <laughs> from the analysis, then the species diversity of tropical coral reefs begins to rival that of a rainforest. Currently, we know that 25% of all marine species are found on less than 1% of the Earth's surface that is covered by coral reefs. And new work coming out of the Smithsonian is that that is more likely to be half of all plant and animal marine species are found on 1% of the Earth's surface, and that is the coral reef. Now, coral reefs are also the most productive of all marine communities with some 2,000 grams carbon, grams carbon per meter squared per year, and much of that in symbiosis with corals. This, this is extraordinary because you can see through coral reef water because there's so little there. Coral reefs are efficient places. So here we have the extraordinary thing. We have the human agricultural systems achieve their high productivity by excluding biodiversity. My family farms here in Ohio, corn, sugar beets, they excluded the biodiversity of the flora and fauna of Seneca County to achieve their high productivity. But coral reefs do it. They achieve their high productivity by the inclusion of biodiversity. It is the inclusion of the diversity of life that results in the high productivity that we find on coral reefs. And they are also the oldest continuous fossil environment on Earth some 400 million years of evolution. So look what coral reefs have done. They are productive. They are diverse. They are longevous. 
And what that means is that to survive, we humans are going to have to learn to know to do what coral reefs do automatically. That is how our civilization will survive if we learn what to do like coral reefs do. So I was interested early in my graduate training on how are coral reefs surviving? So I initiated a series of photographs in the Florida Keys going all the way from Miami to the Dry Tortugas in which we took coral pictures sequentially over time. And what we found is that corals are declining. You can see here these across the Caribbean. These are data. Some 50% of all corals had been lost since the beginning of our study in the 1970s. And that was amazing. But this loss has been especially high in the Elkhorn corals that you can see here, where some 80% of all living Elkhorn coral have died. And that is the result of our scientific investigation. So I'm going to show you an example of that. This is the coral reef off Key West. And this was at the beginning of this survey in 1996, going from stainless steel uh, stakes to stainless steel stakes. And incidentally, I knew where to get that type 316 stainless steel. I went to Youngstown because that's where it's forged and that's where I got it. And I knew that. And here is that same coral reef in 2000 going, going on. And that transect line goes between those stainless steel sticks and they did not move. The coral reefs of the world, our coral reefs are in trouble. Since 1996, Florida has lost 50% of its coral in general. So we're right in there with the Caribbean. But Elkhorn coral, which was the commonest coral in the Caribbean, based on our research, we placed it on the endangered species list. My efforts put an organism that was the most common coral in the Caribbean on the endangered species list. And right here in the Hefner Museum, I walk in and I see this gorgeous specimen. This is Acropora palmata. It was our field of dreams. It went on forever. The coral reef could not ever disappear. It's the oldest environment on Earth, the most protective, the most biodiverse. How could we change that? How could that occur? And I want you to look at this after specimen. This is what museums are for. This is why we know what we know. The mayor of Monroe County said, when the coral shrinks, the economy sinks. Note that right away, that linkage between environmental health and uh, economic health. The, the Greek word from opioids is home, and that becomes economy, and it becomes ecology. The Greeks knew that. That's where that word comes from. So all of us know that there is a phenomenon called coral bleaching, which is caused by increased temperatures. And when the coral reef bleaches, you see it here, it turns white. And we know that high temperatures cause coral bleaching. But what we were looking at off Key West were these white spots. And we described it in 1996. We gave it a name. We called it some, some 14th century plague terminology. We called it white pox. <laughs> white pox, because we didn't know what was causing it. We were in the dark. We're observers, we're seeing change. We're seeing things change that we love, change that we've studied sometimes for a long time. And the only words we have for this kind of phenomenon are things like white pox. But there was something important. This did not look like coral bleaching. It's spotted, yeah, it's, it's white, it's white. And I began to think, Maybe we've got something going on here that is not what everyone says is the reason for the loss of corals in the neighborhood. So what I'm going to do here is to show you a chart looking at coral die-off as a function of time and as a function of temperature. 
So here are the called die-offs. We show up here, 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 and here. And note that what we see is that periods of peak loss in coral correspond in lockstep with high temperatures. Oh, okay, well, that's the whole problem. That's the whole solution. That correlation must be causation. A goal made. That's a global problem. Nothing you can do. However, being somewhat of a contrarian, I decided to plot over the same thing. Local run rainfall, and here it goes. What we're going to do is to plot them, and bingo, there it is. Peak losses also correspond in lockstep with periods of high terrestrial runoff. That is not a function of temperature. That is not a function of a problem that is so big there is nothing you can do. That's a terrestrial runoff that implies something else is going on that is killing coral. So last summer we were in the Keys and this is the technical terminology that we get from scientists who, in their laws and technical language, they were horrified. We're horrified at what's going on in the world around us, what we see. And it is true that throughout the Caribbean, the madness of climate change has indeed spiked temperatures off the charts. However, what I will tell you is that. It is not just water temperature that is changing. It is also water quality as well. Now, how do we know that? We know it in a very interesting way from an interesting pair of graphs that was published in Nature in 2017. We're going to look at this. These are the ways in which these authors in Nature said the world was going outside of its safe operating spaces. It was going outside. That paper had to be retracted and not exactly retracted, but a proviso reissued this year because something about this had changed. And I want you to look at the lower left-hand quadrant, quadrant here, water quality. That's the 2017 paper in Nature. And here it is. 2023. Whoa, this, the other state the same. This one changed. Water quality had to be divided into a new one called green water. That was what motivated the change. And the reason is that using satellites from outer space and data that had been collected since 1970, no one ever thought to task <laughs> the satellite to look at the color. Of the ocean. Why would you do that? I mean, it's down, it's an ocean. But here's what happened. In that time period, the reflected color went from the coastal ocean has become green because things are running off land. That is what we saw from outer space, and that is what required the change in this paper in nature. So I have been monitoring coral reefs for almost the last half century, and we do that with increasing sophistication. But at the same time, we also have been doing water quality. We had two programs. One was the CRMP, Coral Reef Monitoring Project, and the other was the WQMP Water Quality Monitoring Project, done in the same place and at the same time. So I decided, let's put these two things together. So now what you're going to see is a predictive model of what predicts coral death in the Florida Keys. And here are the predictors along the bottom and the relative influence along the top. So the biggest influence over whether a coral will live or die, 35% of this certainty model, is the size of the coral. Well, that has nothing to do with temperature. That is how easily the target is hit by a floating pathogen. The bigger you are, the bigger the target on your back. So that is not a temperature phenomenon. The next most important factor, dissolved oxygen. 
That adds 15% to the certainty of the model. Then let's go to organic carbon here. That adds 7%. Then wind speed, that adds another 6%. Then you have dissolved inorganic nitrogen. That adds another 4%. And finally, sixth in place, you get to temperature. And temperature only adds 3% to the certainty of the model trying to predict for death. And finally, when you add the other eight water quality parameters that we measured, you get an, another 16% boost. And now the model is 85% certain of predicting what coral death is going to be occur. And only 3% of that 85% is temperature. So once again, I'm thinking we're not dealing with a global temperature. But we're dealing with a coastal zone process. So the next thing that we did is we said, what in the hell is in the water? What's in there? So we decided to start measuring for microbes. And we took samples in the water. And we also took samples from the coral themselves. And we focused on alkaline coral specimen that you see here. Because it was the commonest coral, we wanted to work on something that would have impact. It's iconic. It's the reason people come to a tourist destination to swim amongst the sequoia of the ocean. And when we did that, we isolated the bacteria from the water and from the coral, and we were absolutely stunned at what we found. We found that the bacteria that was in the flesh of the coral was Sobratia marcescens. Now, if you decide you're going to do a Google search uh, for Sobratia marcescens, your computer will crash. <laughs> because in one year, you will get 12,000 hits. And it is not because Sobratia marcescens, everybody is working on coral disease. It's because Sauratia marcestens is a well-known human pathogen. It's a human pathogen. It causes Sauratiosis in human beings. It is a leading cause of death in immunocompromised individuals. What are you doing? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a marine biologist. I'm working in a coral reef. And now I'm encountering a human pathogen that is loaded into this. Now, Sauratia marcescens is not a marine bacterium. It does not like salt. It, it dies in salt water. It does not like oxygen. It's, it's in the human stomach. It's enteric bacteria that kills from within. So Sauratia marcescens dies in seawater. And it dies in seawater in less than an hour. And well, sure. <laughs> this thing has done an evolutionary triple jump. The hardest evolutionary jump. Only two organisms have ever done it. It's gone from terrestrial us to marine. It's gone from vertebrate us to the lower invertebrates, corals. And it's gone from the anaerobic conditions of our stomach to the fully oxygenated conditions of the reef. That's a triple jump evolutionarily, and there it is. So basically, what, what have we got going on here? So let's look at Serratia marcescens viability, and we start after the first hour in seawater. It survives, as I said, for one hour. But then, to the experimental media, you add nitrogen, and all of a sudden, whoop, it's surviving 18 hours. Then you add phosphorus, and now it's two days. You add total organic carbon, and now it's three days. And then you add all the nutrients and a little coral mucus, and all of a sudden, five days. That's what you get when you change the ocean from poor water quality. You add the nutrients and you add those for a lot of quality factors. And that's what we saw from outer space. We turned, we turned the coastal ocean green. And that greenness 
famed this human and terrible pathogen. Okay, so where does five days in the ocean, that's the longest we could get it to survive, where does five days in the ocean get you? So we decided we would try and find out. And we did a hydrographic model in which we were looking at the Key West sewage treatment plant, a drifter, we would put it in the water and we would follow it. And usually what happens is the drifter sort of meanders around and goes like that. And then it's, this one goes up to the Gulf of Mexico, but it's blocked because at five days and it's dead. Now, sometimes those currents around Key West will take it south and it will loop around and it will be taken down Hawk Channel like that. And again, it's blocked five days. But every once in a while, the current will take it to Rock Key, Sand Key, off Key West, or to the other reefs that you find in Hawk Channel. And it's less than five days to get to the quality, which it can be killed. And what we see, therefore, is that this was the first place, this was our first paper in science on this. This, we published it from this outbreak of white pox on Key West. No coincidence that it was Key West because Key West here is connected. And what that means is that water movement connects coral reefs and that you must understand the landscape view of what you were doing. And sometimes you are required to take a much longer landscape perspective. And I show you the Mississippi River. All of the river and its tributaries are 9.1 million kilometers long. It drains an area that is 3.2 million square kilometers. And it is a drainage basin for more than 32 states in the lower 48. This is a monstrous system. And this is where I grew in Seneca <laughs> County, Ohio, where my the farm on my mother's side is located outside Kevin, and the second farm on my father's side outside of Z in Green County, not very far from where I am standing. <laughs> Now, and uh, here I am, <laughs> hey, becoming an ecologist and learning about the world around me through the butterflies that I collected here. Across the Midwest and throughout Ohio, atrazine is used to improve productivity of corn and other kinds of fields. And atrazine, of course, is used because it's such an efficient and inexpensive and easily applied herbicide. Massive use all across the Midwest and across Ohio as well. It's cheap. It's easy. It's effective. And that's why it is used. And we can eliminate from this uh, analysis the Seneca County Farm because that drains into the Atlantic. And we're left with this analysis of our Green County Farm, very close to where we are right now. And so here's what happened. If you look at the oxygen production or consumption of a plant, anything above this axis is photosynthesis plus oxygen. Below this is respiration. What you get is under normal conditions before atrazine application, you see a typical productivity. The oxygen is evolved by the photosynthesis. And at night, these plants respire. And there's no light, there's no oxygen evolved, which being confused and consumed. All right, but with the application of atrazine, something different happens. When it is supposed to be photosynthesizing, it is not photosynthesizing. And when at night, of course, it continues to respire. This is the signature, the biochemical signature of atrazine. And one of the reasons that it's such a cheap herbicide is that it lets the plant kill itself. It doesn't need to provide a poison to kill the plant. It simply prevents photosynthesis, but does not prevent respiration 
and with no food coming in, God's plant kills itself. Devilish effect and cheap because it doesn't bother with a complicated toxin. toxin. It just knocks out the photosynthesis. Well, that's fine, but there's a problem. In 1993 was the great Mississippi flood of 1993. And down the Ohio and down the Missouri, Mississippi and down the Missouri, and from farmlands and fields all across the Midwest, atrazine was washed off the farmland and into the water, and down it went through Natchez and coming down, and not just from the field, from the farms, from all the storage facilities of atrazine in every state, in every county, that material washed into the Mississippi River as well, and finally down to the Gulf of Mexico. When it got to the Gulf of Mexico, something extraordinary happened. It stayed as a bolus together. And what you're going to see here now is atrazine con concentrations at the mouth of the Mississippi. Here we go. Before the flood, a little bit of, of atrazine, not much, but as the water discharge speed, there it is. All that atrazine is in the water. It's come from everywhere across the Midwest. It has come from my farms, from our state, from the river that we call the Ohio River. And as I said, it stayed together, and we know that because of this little drifter here, MS20015, that was released when, it, it, when the river mouth uh, emerged. And it began to meander around, but it did not diffuse into this giant water mass called the Gulf of Mexico. It stayed together as a bolus, as a plug, and moved throughout this area it is as that way with a high concentration. Now, I've stopped this animation on August 19th, because on August 19th, something completely unrelated happened. I was in Florida, and I started to look at Coral photosynthesis in this machine here, and what you can see are three chambers. We had N equals three, a light sensor, oxygen electrodes in each of the sensors, stir bars going around because every hour ambient seawater was brought from outside of the machine where it had gone in, and then we recorded photosynthesis, and all the time this was going, and we were doing our intensive research and looking at coral photosynthesis and and very carefully taking samples of the water and very enthusiastically until on the 12th of September, that water sucked by the Gulf Stream North came across the coral reef of the garden that we were studying. And here is the post uh, synthetic record that we measured at the time. We start here again, photosynthesis positive respiration beneath that, and the light goes up and the photosynthesis goes up and everything is doing just fine right here. And there's your, uh, your production and then your nighttime respiration and the P to R ratio was positive. Net photosynthesis, net oxygen evolution, the coral is healthy. And then right there, we saw a midnight September 12th, the Mississippi flood water moved over our chambers. And there was the light came up, but there was no photosynthesis. The corals that are wholly dependent upon this symbiotic algae stopped photosynthesizing. But nighttime came and they continued to respire. And there it is what you see. That is the signal of atrazine had entered our chambers, and we recorded that. Now, fortunately, the next day, the light went up again, meekly, not the whole way, but a little bit of recovery had begun when that stressor had been removed. Coral reefs. More than 1,000 miles away from Ohio were affected by the Mississippi floods of 1993. My family farm was killing my coral reef in Florida. 
And the point is this, we live in a connected world. Everything we do has connections and it doesn't matter whether it is a coral reef in Florida and, and a farmland in Ohio or the atmosphere or anything else. We live in a connected world. You tweak one part of that spider web and the whole web vibrates. And it is things like museums like the Hefner and these specimens that allow us to tell what the reality of the world was before the real world changed. And this connection was unavoidable too in our own studies now going back to our Florida research where the bacteria that we had found, this fecal coliform bacteria, closed down the swing around Key West competition. People had come from all over the world and the nation that thought they were going to win this competition were the Australians. They were the Ethiopian runners <laughs> of, of, of the, the aquatic world. And they had won some years in a row, swim around the island of Key West, and they were the fastest. But the entire competition was stopped. They flew back to Australia. They flew back to Germany because the water quality was poor because of these bacteria that were running off the land. And so that's when we published the etiology of white pox and lethal disease in the Caribbean Elkhorn Coral at Gopora, Palmyra. Now, at that point in time, we knew that the species that were of Serratia marcescens that was killing coral was the same species of bacteria as in our human stuff. We knew that. But what we did not know was whether that strain of the uh, serration marcescens that killed Paul was the same as the strain that kills human beings. And there are other animals, some birds and some fish that have serration marcescens. Human beings aren't the only ones that have it. But that turned into a really weird adventure. Because once we made that announcement and people were so concerned about the cost of wastewater treatment, upgrading, things like that, they started to say, well, other things have serratia marcescens. Maybe it's not humans. Maybe we don't need to change what we do. For instance, he cared. Also, have serratia marcescens. They have the same thing. And he cared, of course, are endangered species. And real estate developers hate endangered species because they're never in the show. Real estate development stops. <laughs> so it did not take very long before the bumper sticker wars of the Florida Keys broke out. <laughs> and the first ones that were issued by the real estate companies are save the reef, shoot the deer. <laughs> My research was going to cause the shooting of an endangered species. I know. <laughs> but the Florida Keys does have environmentalists in it. So the next bumper sticker that came out, which I love, was if it's touristy, <laughs> <they're doing something laughs> so we've got that going back and forth. So now I need a sample from the endangered species. Okay, so I'm from Ohio. I know about deer hunting. Okay, but wait a minute, me shoot shoot the endangered species? No, I don't want to do that. How can I do this? How can I resolve this? So let's set this up. The bacterial species that kills coral is indeed found in both humans and Kidera. But Kidera and humans have different strains, genetic strains of it. So, which terrestrial vertebrate, us or the deer, is closest to the coral disease strain? Is it main man or beast? So, what am I doing now? I'm doing, you know, who done it? But how do you get that sample? You don't want to be the person. Maybe you need something like that. So we got clever. And what we did, let's see if this works. Yes, we decided we'd go to the key here and stalk our place. And what we found it was the Beer food. So we can get the serration strain out of deer food. So we collected the deer food, which you see right there, and uh, we submitted that to the genetic analysis. And so here we go. 
genetic similarity between serratia marces and strain from key deer versus humans. So let's look first at the key deer. It was only 42% on the allele that we looked at. That's not very really good correspondence. But then we did it with humans that are here. <laughs> we had found feeding on a shadow of a cow. And that was our next paper, human pathogen, shown to cause disease in the threatened, now threatened our local whole population. Humans, and only humans, are to blame. We are killing the goose that laid the golden egg. This was the coral reefs of Florida. And so that's when I did something that research academics normally don't believe. I'm with <laughs> we, We've got to get the load out. And that was my first time in front of the camera. And that was one of the reasons why Jeff Olowski asked me to tell the Tracy Paul. I said, yeah, I can do this. But I had done it before. And now we're going to hear from the director of the National Marine Sanctuary, what he said about the work that we did in the Florida Keys. From NBC News. Dramatic pictures, time lapse of the destruction of Elkhorn coral off the Florida Keys. One third gone in just the last six years. A bacteria produces what's commonly called white pox disease. Dr. Porter's research paper points to what environmentalists and resource managers have been fearing for a number of years as the population in the Florida Keys has exploded. This is clearly a smoking gun for us as far as the coral reef health in the Florida Keys that we've been looking for. So here we are. Water problems are emptying beaches. We're in the Florida Keys and look what's happening. Tourists are cutting vacation short. That is an economic disaster. But understand the context. This is a local water quality problem. It requires local action. I'm talking about something that will empower people to take responsibility for their own environment. And the way to do that is to talk to politicians. Oh, no. oh. I went to David Weiss, who was running for Monroe, uh, mayor of Monroe County, and David, like it seems like everybody else in Florida recently, are Republicans. Yeah. And what David said once I showed him the signs, if elected, I will raise your taxes. That's what he, as a Republican, that was his platform. And it wasn't a small amount of money here. It was a percent increase of 13% in property taxes, which would result in $100 million, which is what was going to require to upgrade and connect all the wastewater treatment systems in the Florida Keys. And I honor David for what he did because he didn't whisper this into a microphone the day before the election. He published it in the key order months before the November election. He told people what he was going to do, and David Rice won. And when I asked, when I saw him, I asked him, David, as a Republican, how could you possibly run a successful campaign promising to increase taxes and his responses in the Florida Keys? The environment is a pocketbook issue. I could not have won if I had not pledged to raise taxes. I connected the reality of the economy in South Florida to the reality of the ecology in South Florida. That's one of the ways that you can have success when you promote environmental issues. And I also connected it to human health. Swimmers could now enter the water on the vacation beach. <laughs> human health is a powerful thing. So they got the hundred, David was elected, they got the hundred million dollars and they spent it exactly the way they did, they said they would. So we did something unusual. We did not ask permission <laughs> and tell the water treatment pad plant that we were coming. We sneak in there in the dead of night <laughs> to, take, to take the samples. And here it was before upgrade. This is what it is after for endocoxin, undetectable, for endobacter, undetectable, for E. coli, undetectable, and for the offending bacteria, serration, marcescent, undetectable. 
We succeeded. <laughs> investments were. And that's what I could tell every Republican legislator in, in Ohio, in Georgia, in Florida, in, in our nation's capital. This investment works to protect people and protect their income. This is not free huggers and jobs versus the environment. This is jobs because of the environment. That's the picture. Go green or go broke. That's what we're facing now. So it was a water quality issue. We use science to come up with the answer. That's what so many of you are either teaching or researching or learning that science. This is what you are dedicating your lives to. This is what you should be dedicating your lives to. This is the power of institutions. This is the power of the land. And I've seen it on rich display amongst the students and faculty here. Clients got what they paid for. We said this would happen if they upgraded, and they did. But more importantly, clients got what they wanted. There's the reef in 96, there's the reef in 2000, and here is the reef in 2020. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, you, you, can, you can do things. So if you go to a textbook in environmental science and, and policy, this is the textbook model. Environmental state influences scientific research funding, and we do see that. And that scientific research and understanding then circles around and directly gets public policy that then influences human activities and that then human uh, environmental state. This graph is all wrong. It's missing key arrows. The, the first one is that the revised model should show that we have scientific research influenced public perception and human activities and behavior. We got people to change their voting priorities just by telling the truth. They changed how they thought about that. And more importantly here, we turned economic constraints, which are always used as an excuse not to do the right thing, in, into perceived economic constraints, which you presented in the right way. And there we have it. Those are not constraints. Those become environmental imperatives. And the one I really like is this arrow, which is going the wrong way. It was the environmental state that then influenced human activities. We, we showed that in our research. We showed that. We showed basically that you can make a difference. And, and that means you, you, you can make a difference with the things that you do. Human life and wildlife need exactly the same thing. They need a healthy environment. And that is going to give us the world in which we can live with coral reefs. We can cohabitate with the most diverse, the most productive, the oldest environment on the planet. Take care of ourselves and our environment. That's what this shows so intimately and so successfully. And for that, I thank you for going on this dive with me this evening. Well, not bad. Ohio boy makes good. <laughs> well, that was spectacular. Thank you. We, we have a few minutes for questions, and we also had a seminar this afternoon where we asked people to hold their questions. We had so many other people to talk to. So we'd like to open it up for a few minutes for questions. I'll repeat the questions to make sure everybody can hear them, and then we'll hear Dr. Right. Porter's answer. need the mic. I'll, I'll holler. Yes. Yeah, I'm curious if we look at the Australian side, do we know now what's going on there? Did your study transfer there? So, part of the, <laughs> I'll speak into the lavalier so we can hear that line. The question that is, do, do, does the work here in the coral reefs of Florida and Fargo, does that translate to places like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia or other places around the world? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because if you look at Queensland, well, that's a great deal of work. 
right next door to them is, surprise to surprise, sugar cane, exactly like in South Florida. And it is those nutrients that are washing off the Everglades Agricultural District, excuse me, the Queensland Everglades, Everglades you know, Agricultural System. And yes, the green water that was detected by those satellites was not just in Florida, it was in Australia too. So if we can just implement the Paris Climate Accord a little bit, we can do it globally, we can bring those high temperatures down to the where, point where it's not back-to-back -back bleaching years that will kill poles. It will be every other year where they can recover and come back, or it will be intermittent, maybe not so fast. But if we don't at the same time, whether it is in Florida Keys, as we did, or in Australia, where they have not improved that green water coastal, then all of our efforts with the climate change will come to naught. Thank you for that question. The answer is yes. Questions? This goes back to your talk uh, this afternoon. Um, what you found with uh, increasing temperatures and the health of the coral, is that translatable to forest ecosystems? By the increasing temperatures that are negatively impacting corals, is that same kind of data, does that apply to forest systems? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Well, I'm also going to answer that question in the affirmative, too. Because what we have found in, we went back to the which had lost most of its uh, album coral, um, we went back in just after making Jason Coral in 2019, and we found yes, um, some elder and coral colonies were there now. They differ in their genetic composition from the population of Elkhorn that has died. This population had been shot. Protein was being expressed in their genetic composition. Now, each our protein is interesting. Because human beings have the HR protein, and so do other plants as well. That's not exclusively an animal gene. So if we can just buy ecosystem just a little bit of time, we can do that. We are not going to win all of the battles. We're going to lose some of them, but we can win the war. What you tell your students, what students I tell you, is that it is not hopeless. It is a fight. But you can win some things, and we must. Yes, Russia, go there. <laughs> go back to that, to what your talk was this afternoon. You are talking about giving the ecosystem 100 years to yes. evolve these, yes. these systems. Well, what about taking the, the algae, which I, I assumed was the problem, and trying to do genetic engineering to make things faster so that the algae could survive with the higher temperatures better? Right. So the algae are, are ejected at high temperatures. So can we genetically engineer the algae so that they can survive those high temperatures and stay in the coral? And the answer to that question is also yes as well. The challenge is not going to be doing that because a little invention like recently called CRISPR. We can introduce those genes into symbiotic dosage health. The problem is can we replicate this at scale? And I think natural selection can work very fast but it is the ecosystem impacts that we are most concerned about. And that also is a, a wonderful question because again, it involves uh, students and chasing coral. So I hope all of you remember the person I re consider the star of the documentary, which is Zach Rago, the coral nerd. And we've been to the and, and Zach, you know, just finished college and he was like, I don't know what to do. And I said, you know what? I said, yes, you do. This isn't your life. I'm going to tell you what to do. <laughs> you have to go to graduate school. And I sent him to the University of Hawaii. I wrote the letter, and he was admitted. And he is there now at the University of Hawaii studying with molecular genetics and ecology, symbiotic algae on Hawaii. Well, the reefs. Students are our future. They're the ones that can make the difference. They're the ones that are going to change the world. This is the fight of your generation, but you can't do it. And again, we're making huge progress trying to modify the genetics of the algae to increase heat tolerance. 
But there are limits, maybe two degrees that we can do it, maybe two and a half, but even I am skeptical about saying, oh, we're gonna we're gonna cut the toe and draw a feather on it. But but uh, in the shorter term, if we can implement the Paris climate reports, we can bring those temperatures down to so that we're not reaching every year. So again, the answer to that question is yes. Okay, next question. Back to go with you. Please. Uh, this is not direct, but related to everything. I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on. Uh, we have regulations that um, we started using both sulfur fuel in shipping vessels that um, dramatically improve air quality, yeah. that reduce albedo, the reflectance, mm -hmm. and add it to the warming oceans. And now we're in this position where we're not sure what to do. And I know one of the options thrown out there was to artificially create clouds that weren't sulfur to help increase the albedo. Do you think that's an option? Are there concerns around that? Yeah. So this is a this is a fun question. We're using low sulfur fuel so that we're not making acid rain, but this makes the oceans warm faster because it's not making an awful reflective surface, or it's not making a reflective surface. So we should we we're in a catch twenty two. Stop using bad fuel, or should we make artificial clouds to prevent ocean warming? No, we have to do everything right as fast as we can. I'm in general not very enamored of geoengineering. You know, one idea was to put up a bunch of uh, you know silver dust between the earth and, and and the sun. Well, that's okay, but what happens when the earth cools down? How do you get rid of it? <laughs> you have to think long term. As an ecologist, I think long term. So um I would say, in general, geoengineering fixes um, are ill-advised. So I would be very, very careful with that. But your question does pose a legitimate conundrum. I, you know, there are a lot of things that we might do that um, you know might seem ill-advised. For instance, if you want to start a fight between um, two card-carrying conservation ecologists, you mentioned two words, nuclear power. <laughs> but the marvel of nuclear power is that it does not produce CO2. And right now, we are in triage with the environment. We have to do everything we possibly can. So I went from an anti-nuke to a pro-nuke. Because in Georgia, it has just opened by a global my Volvo has every year it takes 1.4 million cars off the road by its energy production. It prevents six BP oil spills every year. That's the equivalent of what this nuclear power does. So sometimes you'll do contradictory things. But my attitude and what I told the students this afternoon is that we can't just stop using fossil fuel, even though. This kind of you know analysis of coral reef and, and others would suggest we should, but we must use the energy we have to create the future we want. That means when we burn fossil fuels, it is to produce solar energy, it is to produce tidal energy, it is to produce wind energy. We have got to transform our economy, and when we do that, we're going to create good jobs. Good paying jobs, long jobs. We're going to create careers that save the planet and don't destroy it. And I know by listening to our students here, this is what Miami is dedicated to. And again, congratulations to you for doing that. You didn't give the students the simple answers, you gave them the complex question and the complex answers, but you made it possible for them to see a path forward and um and we need to do that as often as we possibly can yeah well thank you looks like we have one more question in the back yeah i uh, one of the things that in your discussion you talked about is the you made the linkage between the death of the coral reefs and your own family farm yeah um in ohio um i've recently been paying a lot of attention to the impact of animal agriculture 
on climate change as well as just you know the, the broader environment. And uh, I've been just stunned by the degree to which animal agriculture accounts for so much of the agriculture that we conduct. Right. And I'm wondering if you know if, if people made a shift to a more plant based diet, um, and there was just less farming going on. Um, to the degree that we are conducting it, then this would also have an impact. Or does that, how does that fit into your discussion? I guess. So tell us about the impacts of animal agriculture on these kinds of issues. Yeah, well, it, it, it has an extraordinary impact. And, and you're right. I mean, uh, farming can, can really lead to incredible water degradation. And I liked your solution, which was more plant-based diet. Um, you know, I mean, red meat is, is fun to eat, but you don't need to eat it every day. I mean, a steak is not just for breakfast anymore. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that kind of thing is going to be an improvement. And Ohio, of course, is incredibly well positioned um, to, to do that kind of, of agriculture. I talked to someone in one of the labs today who was going to work on switchgrass, which is nature's solar battery. It's a native plant. It grows and it can be converted to fossil fuel. So that's good use of land and it produces, it produces a lot of, of, of oil and it's green energy. It's CO2 to CO2, CO2 in, CO2 out. Um, so there are a lot of solutions and, and Ohio can be, you know, in the lead for that. So I'm going to end this with a, with a story of, again about me growing up in Ohio. So, um, I entered and won first place in the natural history division of the Ohio State Fair when I was a student, a, a high school student. And my entry into the fair was a look at butterflies of Seneca County, Ohio, comparing what I had found with what Henninger, who published a list of Seneca County butterflies from the 1930s, said Tom, Seneca County lost to the species. And uh, when I went to the fair, you know, I didn't know whether that was going to resonate. And I, will, I do remember distinctly one of the judges wrote, this is a great project. He labeled all of his studies. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's okay. But there it was, and I proposed a reason that that had happened. When Hunter was studying where I lived, there were forests and streams. And by the time I grew up, 95% of that country is farming. My family farms had done that. The world changes around you. And so look at that again. <clears throat> or a kid from Ohio was studying how over time the environment changes and humans are involved. And responsible. And you just heard a seminar from a senior scientist talking about how the world has changed and how humans are, you know, involved. Did I really ever leave? <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I thank you so much for coming. Okay. One thing I want to do before um, this all is over, and Steve, if you could come forward. Um, Museum people, oh, surprise, surprise, are collectors. <laughs> so I started out with butterflies, and then I started to collect. Well, they were our field of dreams. We could collect them. But the coal collection I made could never be replicated. Now it would not be legal. And the coals would not be there to collect. So the University of Georgia Museum has almost 6,000 specimens that I collected over my lifetime. But I also collected books on policy politics. When I retired, I had 90% of every book ever on Paul's reads back to the 1500s. And this is a catalog of the books in my library. And I am going to give this book to you, Steve, that shows that all the way from the 1600s to the 1500s, People were fascinated, not just with the science of coral reefs, but with the art of coral reefs. The fascinating thing is that if you look at who wrote books on corals, you find an interesting combination. You think of Lamar, 
Linnaeus, Hegel, and Darwin, all names you know, the first book they ever wrote was on Paul Reeves. Darwin, 1842, started distribution of Paul Reeves. 30 years before he ever wrote that trivial statement. But there are these entire communities known as Paul Reeves. Why not? You know, that's what he did. Hegel's first book was on Arabian Peppers and all the gorgeous illustrations. Lamarck's first book was on tropical invertebrates, 1816. He describes that species right there. That was his first book. And Linnaeus' Systema Natura is filled with all the organisms that were applied back to him on sea ships from exotic places. And in my library, I have first editions of all of those first editions. And I love my Darwin book. I love my Darwin book because it has 14 more pages than any but four other copies of it. The reason is, and you'll love this because it addresses what junior science like Trump Darwin, the Hagel Tour. He published his first book, as I said, 1842 Structure and Distribution of Paul Reeves. And he was so proud, he put in the back of this uh, book 14 more pages that talked about the next two books he was trying to write. And that's what the Geology of Tropical Environments and the Geology of Volcanoes, which were his second and third book, and then one for speaking. Well, what happened is his publisher, Smith, and Smith Elder said, Charles. I want you to go back to the publishing house and get those books out of there because you've given too much away. <laughs> if you ever want to publish with me again, you're going to get them from the binder. And we know that Charles dutifully scurried over to the binder and picked out five volumes that had these additional 14 pages. And I purchased one. Of them. <laughs> oh my God. Charlie he was told he was told his publisher. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so, um, so there is the book, and it contains that information and all of the wonderful science, but the wonderful art of and wow. beauty of nature, which is what attracted me. Not that I knew about that subject, but I. It was beautiful, and that was a